All right, you guys know at the end of the day that the goal of this channel is to help you navigate the markets better and understand what is going on. I wanted to talk to you guys about something that I don't think we talk about enough, especially during times like this when we have economic uncertainty and we're certainly in a bear market. And that is the fact that some companies that were a victim of this bear market, the fact that some of them will never get back to all time highs like ever. And this is something that I think we have to realistically come to terms with, especially if some of us were blindsided by hyper growth companies like DraftKings or Peloton or Palantir, or some of you are not going to like that, Teladoc or DocuSign or uh, Zoom. We have to understand that a lot of these companies were trading at valuations that were just too ridiculous to bear. And we don't even have to attack the quote unquote Kathy stocks. We can actually take a look at blue chips like Nvidia, which at $160 is still trading over 30 times PE. So why am I bringing this up? Oh, <laughs> this was hilarious, by the way. I had this up in my last video and a few of you were confused about it saying, you know, why are you saying that Netflix is a buy? I'm not saying Netflix is a buy. This was a joke based on Kramer saying that Netflix was a buy at 600. This was back from, this was a tweet from January. Anyway, it was just a joke. But why am I saying this? It's because I stumbled across this article from Business Insider from 2011. I was looking at historical articles because I wanted to see how was the media framing certain economic events. Obviously during economic events, especially during negative ones, we tend to hear these doom and gloom scenarios, right? Like, is the market going to zero? Are we going to the worst recession of all time? What is going to happen with this stock or that company XYZ? Are we going to be in a lost decade where we don't see returns for 10 years? So I really like to look at historical articles, especially ones that were occurring during economic turmoil or during market downturns and see what the headlines were at the time and see whether they were actually correct or not. Now, most of them are hyperbolic and they're really written for that time frame. And obviously the doom and gloom scenario that they project ends up not panning out. However, this one struck my attention. This is an article from July 20th, 2011. So we're talking about almost 11 years ago. This was coming right out of the financial crisis when it looked like we were on the verge of a recovery, but not really. And it said 10 companies that will never trade again or that will never again trade at their all time highs. Now we have to go through this article because obviously I want to go through the companies listed here and see whether that's true or not. And then try to apply that to what is going on today because I think there's this fallacy that, hey, if you wait long enough, every company is gonna get back to all-time highs. And I think you will be utterly surprised by what we find here. So let's step through it. There are some companies that have never returned back to their all-time highs. And I will tell you how to easily avoid these value traps. All right, so on this list, and there are gonna be some surprises here, I promise you. We have BP, the oil company, Gap, GE, General Electric, we have Pfizer, the pharmaceutical company. This is an interesting one, especially considering the pandemic. We have RIM, which is BlackBerry, Ford, which is interesting, Google, Citigroup, and yes, Microsoft. This article said in 2011 that Microsoft will never get back to the all-time highs that it saw in 1999, which was near the height of the dot-com boom. So which of these companies was this article right about? Surprisingly, more than half. This is the scary part because in this case, we're not even talking about hyper growth stocks. Some of these stocks were blue chips and some of them were at the time or near the time, the highest, some of the highest market cap uh, companies or, or, or most uh, expensive companies by market cap. I mean, some of these were considered blue chips. Like you look at BP, British Petroleum. This article says that British Petroleum will never get to $70 again. Was the article right? Yes. Lo and behold, the article was right. BP never even got close to $70. And today, even with gas prices, considering what gas prices are right now, is at the time of this recording, BP is still trading at $27. So this is a company that never got back to all-time highs. Now, Gap, this is a really interesting one because it said that it would never get back to the all-time highs of $50. However, it did actually get quite close to that back in 
2013. So shortly after that article was written, 2013, 2014, Gap was trading at around 47. So yes, it didn't quite get to 50 and it's currently trading at $9. At the height of the post pandemic boom, it did get to 37 bucks, but the article was right. Never got back to 50 bucks. Now we start getting into even the more blue chips, General Electric. Why do I say blue chips? Well, I want you to look at in 2008, where General Electric ranked in terms of companies by market cap. Yes, you're reading this correctly. General Electric was the second most valuable company on planet Earth at $365.5 billion market cap. Now, the article said that GE would never get back to $60, and lo and behold, it didn't. Right now, it's trading at $66, but that isn't after a one for eight reverse split that it did last year. So really it's price right now before the split is $8 and a quarter thereabouts. Now we get to Pfizer, the first of the stocks that the article was actually wrong about. Now you could make the case that if it wasn't for the pandemic, Pfizer would not have gotten back to its all time highs and it probably wouldn't have. But this is not how these things go. The pandemic did happen. Pfizer did make one of the most successful vaccines and it did hit and surpassed it's all-time highs at above $61. This article saying that Pfizer would never get back to 45 bucks. BlackBerry, we all know the story there. This article came out in 2011, so smartphones at this time have already been out for three to four years. It was pretty easy to see. This was not a, you know, sort of a uh, clairvoyant call here, but yes, no surprise there. BlackBerry never got back to $140. Ford, this one is interesting because Ford is now aside from Tesla trying to lead the EV revolution in America. And this article said that Ford would never get back to $40. Now, interestingly enough, post pandemic at the height of the EV euphoria, Ford did get to 25 bucks, but it is true. Ford never got back to $40, not even close. And it is currently trading back at 11. On to the juicy ones, Google. This one, obviously they got wrong. Now, Google they said that Google would never get back to $747, a price that it hit in October 2007 before the financial crisis. It considered Google hyper growth at the time and said that its growth of $9 billion in the last quarter as of the time of the article's writing was not impressive enough. It also said it's not clear how Google will make money off of Android, which again, smartphones were out for three to four years at this time. And obviously this was before the revolution of cloud computing. It also stated that Google would need to grow its market share in China. No, it doesn't. And no, it didn't. But rightfully so, it said Google would need to show large profits on business outside of its core search franchise. And it has, just like Amazon did with AWS, just like Microsoft did with Azure. And I'm surprised Amazon was actually not on this list. So as you know, Google well surpassed the $747 and it actually did hit a high of $3,000 earlier this year. And it's about to do a 20 for one split because its stock price has gotten so high. So definitely they got it wrong on Google. Citigroup, this was interesting. Citigroup was trading at $585. However, it just was not able to recover after the financial crisis. And Citigroup to this day still trades at $46. So rightfully so, Citi never got back to the days of yore. And lastly, Microsoft, another one that they were utterly wrong about, said that Microsoft would not trade above $60. Obviously, Microsoft being the second most valuable company in the entire stock exchange, already hit a high of almost 350 bucks, currently trades at, at almost 250 bucks, so well over $60. But again, there was no way to know the different uh, business verticals that Microsoft would enter into, the fact that they're creating their own uh, PCs now or computers now with, with the Surface line. As I mentioned before, cloud computing with Microsoft Azure. The fact that they've adopted a subscription-based model for their Office products, uh, their Teams product, which is now widely used, just as widely used as something like Zoom. And then obviously their entry into cybersecurity, which was not really foreseen at the time. So why is this important? Well, again, this is important because one, obviously nobody can tell the future, right? So companies like Microsoft, like Google, like Pfizer, those companies well surpassed their all-time highs. But at the time, it was really difficult to see, even though they, they were blue chip companies. Microsoft was a blue chip company, so was Google, so was Pfizer. So it's not like we were talking about hyper growth companies that haven't proven themselves through earnings, like a Teladoc or Zoom or DocuSign, et cetera. But still at the time, it was hard for the media to see that these companies and for the market itself to see that these companies can actually surpass all-time highs. However, the article was more than right on companies, some of them blue chips like BP, Gap, 
General Electric, BlackBerry, not a blue chip, obviously, Ford, Citigroup, and Gannett. So more than half of them they were right about. And I bring this up because if you guys are bag holding stocks like Zoom, if you're back if you're bag holding stocks like DraftKings or maybe Tattooed Chef or whatever it is, pick pick your favorite stocks. Maybe Palantir's in there as well. Is Palantir ever going to see $45 again? I don't I personally don't think so. You know, if we're talking about some blue chips here never getting back to their all-time highs and what about these hyper growth companies? that were valued in the most overinflated stock market ever, right? And you can even make a case for for Nvidia. I mean, you know, is Nvidia going to get back to what what was it? 350 bucks? Cuz even right now, if you look at it at $158, it's trading at 32 times earnings. So just like that article said about Microsoft, a company like Nvidia would actually have to do something extraordinary to come up and meet these valuations. So imagine what that means for hyper growth companies that haven't proven anything yet. I'm just telling you this because I want you to understand that there is a fallacy, almost like a gambler's fallacy, that companies will always get back to all time highs. No, they won't. However, here's how you fix this. If you are too stressed out with picking individual companies or you feel like you don't have the ability to read financial statements or valuations, this is very easy. All you have to do is invest in the American stock market indices, NASDAQ and the S&P 500, or even just the S&P 500. Now, why is that? Well, because you don't have to do any stock picking. If you look at the S&P 500, for instance, the top holdings in the S&P 500 are always going to change. The top 10 in the S&P 500 in 2011 is not the same, not even remotely the same as the top 10 that you, that you see today. You see, the way that the S&P 500 ETFs work is that they rebalance these portfolios constantly based on the company's market caps, that's all. So if you look at the top 10 holdings in the S&P 500, these are all the largest companies in the US stock market by market cap. Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, Tesla, Berkshire Hathaway, Johnson & Johnson, United Health Group, NVIDIA. So as opposed to investing in individual companies heavily and trying to pick the next stock to blow up, um, you probably should be putting most of your money in index funds and allowing these things to rebalance for you based on the changing landscapes in the market. I talk about this all the time, but back in 2008, when I was investing in the crash, the biggest companies in the world were basically oil companies and a bunch of consumer discretionary and non-discretionary stocks. You did have a couple of tech companies in there, like Microsoft was the only tech company actually in the top 10 back in 2008. Google and Apple were number 17 and 18, followed by Intel at 19. You even had a tobacco company that was rated higher than those tech companies. So the landscape is always changing and the moral of the story at the end of the day, if you're not a great stock picker or you're not a, an active trader, then probably you should look into index funds buying during bear markets, and then maybe speculating a bit on your favorite hyper growth company if you have conviction in it for some reason with a portion of your portfolio. But hey, to each their own, do what thou wilt. What do I know? I'm just a guy on the internet. Anyway, traders, that is it for this video. As most of you know by now, the signups to our elite trading group are actually closed. So if you wanna get our analysis, our day trades, our options alerts, you want access to the chat, the Zoom calls with me, the masterminds, the coaching calls, the beginner section, et cetera, you have to apply for it. You will see a link down below. So apply there, schedule a call with one of our ambassadors. They will get you going through the application process. Let me know in the comment section below what you think of this video. Let me know what stocks you are holding that you think are going to recover or stocks that you are holding that you think are not going to recover. Hit that thumbs up if you get anything out of this video. Subscribe to the channel. Stay safe out there, traders. Peace.